yours. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm uh, Ambra Celotto. Can you hear me if I stay here? Okay. I'm a second year PhD student at uh, NTNU, Norwegian University of Science and Technology. My main supervisor is uh, Professor Filippo Berto. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, cold pressure welding of aluminum, which is quite uh, an open topic in my case because I'm going to tell you what is, uh, we have been doing both at the macro scale, so for the, oof, with the conventional process and uh, how we develop the macro scale technique that actually Filippo introduced this morning uh, with the at the FIB. So what I'm going to do is to get a, a brief introduction of the background of, and the motivations. Uh, I will tell you what is cold pressure welding at the macro scale and then I'll tell you how we developed and we are developing the micro scale technique and uh, actually one of the most important part of this presentation, what we are planning to do, because uh, as I said, it's open topic for us. So let's start introducing uh, what microscale welding is. And micro we, we talk about microscale welding when we are talking about a joining process that is able to, cap to couple uh, parts that don't exceed 100 micrometer in a characteristic dimension like for example the uh, a sheet thickness or a wire diameter. And if you look into literature uh, searching for a micro scale welding, you s will struggle to find something that is at the solid state. So you will always find something that includes heating. And we all know what heating can do to our base metals. Um, so at what we did in our group is to develop the heat process that uh, Professor Berto introduced this morning, but if we want to downscale this process, this looked too complicated for us. So we wanted a simplified version, which is called pressure welding. And with cold pressure welding, you can couple wires or plates. In our case, we studied the, the wires, and it consists in putting close contact to metal pieces, these wires in this case, and apply a compressive force in the longitudinal direction. And this can uh, get can reach bonding at room temperature just by pressure, surface expansion, and shear deformation that are the common mm, bonding mechanisms that occur also in the heat process. And in practice, this takes place like this. So we have these two wires inside the inside two clamps that are continuously taking a new grip and put the these wires uh, in close contact. And and they they form a flash here in the I'm always yeah here in the in the middle, and what we obtain is our joint. So I'm I'm going to tell you now how we characterize these joints that we obtain that look like this. So uh, what we could see before inside the clamps where was this flash here that is mainly oxide that was squeezed out, and in our case. The specimens were 1.4 millimeters in diameter, and um, we were able to machine the gouge length down to one millimeter in, di in diameter to be able to test them. The cases are uh, the cases tested were tested were the raw wires, so the 682 alloy and the wo and a 1070 alloy, and then we made the, the we compare them with the joints, so the three combinations of uh, the joints that we could get. Could get from these raw wires. And how did we test them? With the, this small machine, it's a machine like this, that we can put inside the SEM and look uh, in situ what, what is happening. And what we get is something like this. So we were able to uh, monitor in real time what the damaging mechanism um, how the damaging mechanism was um, was happening, and uh, this is just the case of the mixed joint, the 62 towards 1070 alloy, and um, we also got some results for the stress elongation curves, but these are has to be have to be considered like preliminary because we need more uh, a higher uh, statistical sample because we just tested few few specimens for each type, so. 
it's n they are not considered enough to be, uh, yeah, to, to get some numbers out, some uh, quantitative uh, uh, properties out of this. Uh, but from this uh, test, we could also have a close-up on the fracture surfaces while the test is where we're happening. And if we try to focus to the um, mixed joint, the 682 towards 1000, we see that actually didn't break, mo all of them didn't break uh, at the interface. But in this case, we were wondering why uh, here and not uh, in uh, further down in the bolt material. So what we did, it was uh, doing an EBSD mapping at across the interface. What this told us, first of all, uh, it was that there's a severe grain refinement in the 62 side and uh, a high anisotropic behavior due, of course, to the high deformation that the uh, samples um, uh, undergoes, undergo. And uh, actually this uh, grain refinement is confirmed by the micro hardness profile, uh, which as you can notice actually is quite uh, unusual for a welding to, to have hardness increasing close to the interface, but this is due be to the fact that we are talking about solid state and um, a process that involves work hardening close to the interface. But micro hardness was not enough to get an overview of what is happening at the interface, so we needed, here is not visible, but we needed a close up in this region here, minus plus uh, uh, 500 microns, and this was what we get from non indentation. And from here we see that the interface is super sharp. Uh, the, the values of the hardness um, changes very uh, fastly. Uh, but then if we do, we, if we go back to the EBSD mapping and we take some maps from the bulk part, so uh, from these two pieces far away from the interface, we see that not only the grains are way larger than compared to the interface ones, but also they rotated. And we can see this phenomena here from the polar polarized lens uh, micrographies. Uh, in which we see that, first of all, the material flows in this way, uh, and of course it's because it was constrained by the, the clamps, uh, but above all, we see here, in this region, the grains are rotating, and it's actually, it, it can be correlated uh, to the fracture uh, mechanism and, and to this zone, which is, it seems to be the weakest one in this case. So this was all we have been done, have been doing uh, for the macro scale technique. And then we need to take this as a, as a reference at the macro scale to try to develop the micro one. And to do this, we use the FIB microscope. The FIB is uh, basically an SEM, a scanning electron microscope, equipped with uh, several tools is normally used in the research field for uh, TM sample preparation and uh, circuit modification, repairing it, um, and also 3D FIB tomography is possible. And it consists in, a, in an electron beam, like in, the, in a regular SEM, that allows us to see the sample from the top, but the sample can be visible also with the focused ion beam from another perspective. But the the principal aim of the focused ion beam is that when focused at high current, you can basically mill material pieces and create new microstructures on the sample. And then we have a micro manipulator that consists in a, in a needle that can move material pieces inside the, inside the chamber. And then, last but not least, we have the gas injection system that allows to uh, deposit uh, chemical layers, uh, for example, of platinum, of carbon, that can help to glue parts or to protect some other parts that we need to, uh, to preserve. So how do we, <laughs> could we downscale this process inside uh, the FIB? 
and we, we realized the only part moving was the micromanipulator. So we thought that it could be the way in which we could apply a force towards a sample called the base metal. And um, so we, we take out this manipulator and we use it, as I said, to, ap to apply the required force. Then we take out this uh, tanks and needle, we put it in the fib, and we and we have to replace this tip to make it to uh, to make it feed the filler wire. So we take the need we take the needle, always by fib milling, we truncate this tip, we replace it with with an aluminium tip. This is all made inside the microscope. And then we secure the two parts with uh, a layer of platinum all around. When this is done, we have also to shave it. And this takes place like this. We have to mill one side, rotate, keep on milling, making this uh, uh, ring all around. It's a, an iterative procedure that uh, gets at the end uh, to this hybrid needle. And this is what we saw already this morning. Uh, the our welding technique at the micro scale, and what we liked it was that when we retract the needle, the filler metal was kept inside. That means, of course, that something stronger was uh, retaining it inside the hole. Um, so then we took what uh, we hope is our micro joint, and uh, with the filler metal in the side and the base metal outside. We dig the ramp in front of it to, uh, to see it from the side and get a, a cross section of the, of the joint. And what we get is, it was supposed to be animation, but yeah, this is the whole joint. And we did EDS mapping on the interface. Unfortunate, unfortunately, what we saw is that by EDS mapping uh, across the interface, there was an oxide layer that prevents the bond to occur because of these porosities. And there is a severe gallium uh, implantation across the grain boundaries. This is quite, quite a well-known problem when it comes to using aluminum inside a fib because alumi uh, gallium can... Uh, uh, diffuse along the grain boundaries and it, it acts like uh, a fluid between the grains and of course it uh, softens the material and uh, decreases the, the strength, the mechanical properties. So basically we have to get rid of both of this oxide and gallium. But when it comes to see this region here that looks a, a bit better and more promising from the bonding point, point of view, we see that still of course, there's the gallium that we cannot get rid from, but the oxide was was uh, likely removed, and we can say that at least where where there's no oxide, we can get bonding. So let's try to sum up and see what is next. So from the macro scale uh, point, we saw that the the joints uh, showed uh, ductile behavior, and in general the the fracture occurred far from the interface, the bonded interface. And uh, there was a grain rotation zone uh, in which the, the grains looked to be weaker. And then from the other side in the micro scale, uh, we the setup has been changed uh, several times, but this is the optimized technique that we, uh, we reached. But on the other hand, we need to get rid of, of gallium oxide and of course, we need to assess the bond properties. And for doing this, we are planning to do a cantilever bending test, micro cantilever bending test, of course, both on the macro uh, joints to use them as a reference for doing the same test in the micro one. And this will be done with the pico indenter that you see in the picture. And of course, uh, still in, uh, we will be able to see the test uh, inside the SEM, so in real time. Then uh, we will uh, uh, study the same thing, but joining copper and aluminum. In this case, 
it's a bit difficult, more difficult because the bonding criteria, the, the bonding of course because of uh, diffusion and there will be, we, we expect uh, intermetallics to occur to be created at the interface. So it will be maybe more interesting and then, of course, as I said, uh, we can we have to avoid these two, and the gallium has to be can be avoided by using a plasma sieve that has recently been bought uh, in our department. So I will hopefully soon use it, and uh, probably we are probably we we are planning to modify the relative dimensions of the parts to be coupled to be able to. Uh, increase the deformation and to squeeze out the oxide layer and to be able to cap to have a stronger bonding. So for this, I have to acknowledge the same project, uh, Antonio Nanolab, which is a Norfab facility and the Research Council of Norway. So thanks so much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed, and if you have any questions. <coughs> we did, thank you.